Um, it's really a, a pleasure to be presenting. I really appreciate the invitation and thank you for all of you for coming today. Um, so the the title of the talk is Anti-Democratic Attitudes and Support for Partisan Violence Are Misperceptions to Blame. Um, and hopefully, it'll, it, I know this is not an entirely political science audience, but hopefully you'll see the influence of particularly scientific communication as I move through the talk somewhat. But let me start by putting it in a little bit of broader um, context in terms of, of political science and, and politics um, and how we can think about the political developments over the last two decades um, in the U.S. And we could go all the way back to the Federalist Papers, um, where they, they had this grave concern for what became parties. They referred to them as factions at the time. And their worry was that, that people would pursue their partisan or factional interests ahead of the, the countries. Um, and this was perhaps best captured in a farewell address that George Washington gave, which I think is a, a kind of an interesting quote insofar as one could imagine this quote being said in, in 2021. Um, a party kindles the animosity of one party against another, foments occasional riot and insurrection. It opens the door to foreign influence and corruption. And so in some ways, this is a very prophetic um, quote, obviously. Um, but it, it was interesting if you kind of go through the evolution of scholarship amongst political scientists, you see this ebb and flow of the importance of partisanship. So if you go back to the middle of the 20th century, there was this very serious concern amongst political and social scientists about that parties were not strong enough, um, that we really need strong parties to ensure collective responsibility. And even at the turn of the century, you can see the quote there at the bottom, the scholarly consensus um, was really focused on party decline. So there wasn't a lot of worry about parties being too strong, but rather parties were too weak. If we fast forward to 20 years or so, we got a completely diametrically opposed picture. Um, and so this was just from a policy forum that captured kind of the state of thinking at the time that it was published in 2020, right before the, the election. Um, and you can see the title, Political Sectarianism in America, a Poisonous Cocktail of Othering, Aversion, and Moralization Poses a Threat to Democracy. So you see this very big flip in terms of concern about um, political parties specifically. And then there are all kinds of books that I'm sure some of you have seen kind of around this general topic. And so what I'm gonna do in the talk is I'm gonna briefly talk about what happens in these 20 years and polarization. And then I'll talk about the rise of concern or anti-democratic attitudes and partisan violence. I'll talk about meta perceptions. I'm gonna then present some theory and an experiment. And then depending on time, I'll either go to conclusions, which I might do given, given um, the time, uh, but I'm going to end not with a, actually with a conclusion per se, but rather a variety of questions that I think are kind of on the research agenda at present. Um, so first, because I'm going to end with this, uh, again, I'm going to kind of put this in larger context. When we think about maintaining American democracy, you can think back to kind of high school. If you, if you were, had high school in the U.S., you learned about these two different checks, um, specifically that uh, in the Federalist Papers, they talk about pluralism insofar as this country is a very large country, so there are a lot of cross-cutting cleavages. People have a lot of different group identities and group memberships, and that's going to go across different parties. And so there was a, a presumption that that would serve as a check. And then, of course, the American political institutions themselves in, in, in envelop checks and balances between branches of government and um, national and state governments as well. So what's happened in the 21st century, though, if we look at trends going back to 2000, um, this is just American National Election Study data, is what you've seen is this, these processes of sorting. Um, and specifically, if you just look at the graph, if you look at the top two lines and you look at 2000, what you see is 78, what, what that shows is 78% of Democrats in 2000 consider themselves liberal, and that's gone all the way up to 90% in 2020. And Republicans, 67% of Republicans thought of themselves as conservative and um, 19 in 2000, but it's gone up to 88% in um, 2020. So what you've seen is this ideological sorting such that Republicans and Democrats have become pretty consistent in their ideology. So there's not this kind of cross-cutting ideology. Yet. There, there wasn't a huge amount in 2000, but now it's virtually non-existent. And then if you look at the bottom two lines, which looks at white partisans, and I could have, that was just a, a kind of an easy heuristic, but I could have used any a variety of other racial ethnic groups or religious groups, um, even by income, uh, definitely by education. But what we see at the turn of the century, the percentage of white Democrats and Republicans was virtually statistically the same, right? 44% and 42%. But what we see 22, 20 years later is that of Democrats, um, only 37% identify as white, whereas of Republicans, 
we public um, identify it as white. And so the flip side of that, of course, is that non-white partisans are identifying at a much greater right rate as Democrats than Republicans. And so we see this kind of racial and ethnic sorting as well. And so what that means is basically that partisanship has, as the sorting has gone on uh, along ideological and social lines, is that partisanship has become a, what might be called a mega identity, that it envelops other groups and offerings and, and, and ideologies. And that poses a challenge for the pluralism check that I referred to a little bit earlier. And it also echoes a concern that was raised in Federalist 10 that elites could div divide mankind into parties and inflame them with mutual animosity because they, there, there isn't this pluralism dividing them amongst themselves. This is perhaps most captured in what is called affective polarization. And so what this is, is a graph of a, a question that's asked on the American National Election Study that asks people to rate on a scale from zero to 100 how cold or warm they feel towards various groups, including the political parties. And so what that's on the y-axis is just the rating they gave. On the, the, the top line is the rating that one gives to their own party. So if you're a Democrat, what you give to a Democratic party, and if you're a Republican, what you give to a Republican party. And what you see is since 1976, what you feel about your own party has remained fairly flat. But when you go to the bottom line, which is what you rate the other party, so if you're a Democrat, what you would rate Republicans, you see this monotonic decline, such that in 1976, you were fairly indifferent. You were at about a 50 in terms of rating the other party. But in 2020, it had dropped all the way to 22 degrees. And so you had, you've seen this enormous erosion of almost 30 percentage points on a 100 percentage point scale um, or 101 percentage point scale um, towards what we might call partisan animosity. And so the idea is that because the, the, the parties have come to envelop all these different identities and values, people have seen them in a much more negative light when they're when they're the, the party different from their own, because they envelop all the things that are different from themselves. So an impact of that um, is that there's been increasing concern about the, the what, what that means for anti-democratic attitudes, and kind of part of that is partisan violence. And so there's some debate about the exact relationship between the trends that I just put up and these other outcomes. But if nothing else, it certainly has led that, and, and of course, national events in the last um, um, five to 10 years have led to this considerable concern about the rise of anti-democratic attitudes and the rise of support for partisan violence. And so I'm going to talk about those two things and define them and kind of characterize the dynamics behind them. When we talk about anti-democratic attitudes, we can think of violations of laws or norms or ideals. Um, we can talk about them in terms of electoral fairness, constitutional practices, or civil liberties. So they come in a lots of different varieties and across various different dimensions. And one way to think about them is, is cast in what might be thought of as a coordination game. And this was a theory that was put forth by an article that I, that I have on the slide there. And basically, the idea is that elites are going to maintain democratic attitudes. So they're not going to violate democratic norms because they think that if they do violate democratic norms, then they're going to lose support from citizens, even their own partisans, that citizens will, will not support them um, if they are anti-democratic. So then that raises the question of will citizens actually do that? And the basic idea is that citizens value democracy because they fear that if they don't do that, then the other side will not do it either. And if the other side gains power, then they're going to be oppressed. So in other words, citizens are anticipating that the other side is going to be democratic and hold their leaders accountable to be democratic and vice versa. And so everybody's anticipating that each other is going to remain democratic. So you arrive at this kind of equilibrium for maintaining democracy. Citizens will publish elites, even co-partisans for being anti-democratic, and they anticipate that the other side will be the same. So it's this kind of very um, kind of fragile equilibrium in some sense, because it depends on what you anticipate the other side doing. So in this article, just to give you some, again, some time context, in 1997, the article was a theoretical article, and to the extent that he talked about the United States, he had one footnote. Um, and in that footnote, he said the U.S. Constitution has proved binding in practice, partly because citizens are willing to defend it by reacting against proposed violations, anticipating that reaction political leaders rarely attempt violations. Citizens' reaction re implies that U.S. constitutional restrictions on electoral elected officials are self-enforcing. So kind of this presumption that everything is working fine, that we all anticipate each other is going to support anti uh is going to punish any anti-democratic behaviors. Now, if we look at 2020, 
Um, this was a report from a project that monitors public opinion and the opinion of, of scientific experts as well as um, politicians themselves. And you can see here a very different pre um, presumption. Support for co-partisans co taking illiberal actions was discouragingly widespread, indicating once again that normative commitments described are not always upheld in practice. So you see again a very different picture in around 2020, 2021 than you saw at the turn of the century. So I'm going to come back to that in, in a moment, but let me turn to partisan violence. And so partisan by partisan violence, what what what, I'm, what we mean is partisan is endorsing physically or threatening physically threatening or harming opponents. And the concern there's a concern both for actual violence, um, although there's a broader concern insofar as the percentage of people who might actually engage in political or partisan violence might be fairly low. There's a concern for the normalization of that violence. That is where violence becomes a seen as a legitimate way to resolve conflict, right? So instead of going through governance institutions, we go through violent mechanisms. And not only might that normalize political violence, but it could normalize other types of violence as well instead of um, certain dispute resolution procedures. And so there's a, various, there's a, a serious concern about that normalization. So when we think about a theory of political or partisan violence, it looks very similar to the theory of de anti-democratic attitudes that I put up before. Um, Specifically, we're going to think about a security threat. And the idea here is that individuals typically support violence preemptively to do a threat from the other side. Um, that is, they support defensive violence, that most people, generally speaking, are not offensively violent. They're not looking to initiate violence per se. But if they anticipate that the other side or another group in an intergroup of relations is going to become violent towards their group, then they're going to be more likely to support violence kind of preemptively to, to prevent being the, the victims of that violence. And so very similar to the anti-democratic equilibrium, the equilibrium for nonviolence is that citizens do not anticipate the other side acting violently in the first place. And basically, uh, you know, obviously with January 6th, but other variety of other events, maybe at least going back to the Charlottesville um, 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 killing, um, there's been increasing concern about partisan violence in the United States. And people have turned to studying this um, with, with much greater rigor than they had in, in previous um, generations or even, even a decade ago among social scientists looking specifically at political or partisan violence in the U.S. And so kind of to summarize where I am and kind of get where I'm going um, is we've seen this sorting that led to animosity, which led to anti-democratic attitudes and partisan violence. Um, and both those things depend on beliefs about what the other side will do. And as I said, why do these attitudes matter? Um, you know, one, one is that these norms of kind of uh, having democratic or not anti-democratic attitudes provide um, guardrails, right? When norms collapse, it provides elites with um, constitutional loopholes that they can use to gain undemocratic electoral advantage. And so as soon as citizens stop engaging in support of norms, you start to fall, you can start to erode in terms of democratic um, um, norms, uh, democratic behaviors. And then, of course, any of these attitudes could correlate quite clearly with behaviors themselves, right? Engaging in anti-democratic practices or engaging in violence um, itself. So it turns out that this idea of anticipating the other side, some of you might be familiar with this term meta-perception. And what a meta-perception is, is what you believe the other side believes, and roughly. It's a, it's a little bit more specific in psychological terms, but um, roughly speaking, for our purposes, we're going to define it as that. And so if you're a Republican, an anti-democratic meta-perception would be a question like, would an average Democrat support significantly reinterpreting the Constitution in order to block Republican policies? So that is, if you're a Republican, what do you think the average Democrat would think in terms of reinterpreting the Constitution? And a, a violent one would be, again, you're a Republican. How do you think an average Democrat would respond to follow, the following question? How much do you feel it is justified for Democrats to use violence in advancing their goals in advancing their goals these days? So again, it's what you think the average of the other side would do. And what research shows is that your meta perceptions of the other side correlate very much with what you actually believe yourself. And so kind of consistent with the theories that I put up before, what you think the other side is going to do affects what you're going to do yourself. Now, that might not be a problem per se, um, but it becomes a particularly a problematic because we also know that people tend to exaggerate meta perceptions of other groups. And that comes from at least two different kind of theoretical perspectives. One is the very basic ingredients of social identity theory would suggest that 
People like to attribute malicious motivations to an outgroup as a source of in-group esteem or ideological dislike, and so they're going to look at another group in more negative terms than is probably accurate. Um, and then just work on kind of the political co context and information environment in contemporary times is that partisans believe rival partisans are more extreme than they actually are. And that stems in part because what we see in the media and on social media is often um, extreme portrayals, right? It's the people who are on the more extreme edges of the party that seem, seem to get attention or draw attention to themselves. And so we just think of them when we think of parties. Um, and so the problem then is if you think the other side is more anti-democratic or more violent than they actually are, and that's driving your own attitudes, that means you might become more anti-democratic and violent than you otherwise would be. So it seems like there's an easy solution, right? The solution is to correct those inaccurate meta perceptions. So if I'm a Republican and I think Democrats are going to be really violent, so therefore I'm kind of going to endorse violence. I just need to have somebody come around and correct me and tell me, oh, actually, Republicans are not particularly violent. This is how violent they actually are. And that will tamp down my own support for political violence. And there have been, and I'm going to show you as part of this study that I'm going to put up how these work, but there have been dozens, um, if not, um, you know, almost 100 experiments. It's really been a cottage industry in the last four or five years where people are going around and they're correcting people's meta perceptions. And it seems to reduce these kind of um, deleterious behaviors that I put up before. And they've been quite celebrated. So I'll just give you two quotes. Um, one is from the article that I had put up at the start of the talk. It says that this intervention holds particular promise for ameliorating political sectarianism. Another article that replicated these types of corrections having an effect in 25 out of 26 countries um, really celebrated it. It said reducing that belief has the potential to increase social cohesion and well being of populations around the world. So, quite a strong endorsement of this easy correction approach to meta perceptions. I should say as an aside, um, because a lot of you might be familiar with um, scientific misinformation and the use of, of, corrections, of, of uh, corrections of misinformation and the reality that those corrections often do not work. It's actually been quite interesting and you kind of see as my talk goes along, how it might connect, that this literature on corrections has very, has very little interface with, with that literature. And it probably would have been beneficial to Kind of draw on that literature a little bit more as, you, as you'll see as I, as I kind of go along in the talk. All right, I'm going to skip over that. Um, and so the question that I asked, that so a lot of that was background to kind of situate what I'm doing, which is this very specific experiment, but I'm trying to make clear what the implications are, or at least what I think they are, is can these corrections actually contribute to more stability and so far as they tamp down undemocratic attitudes or support for partisan violence? And so I'm going to present this in a little bit of an awkward fashion. I'm gonna present an experiment. First, let me tell you a little bit about the experiment. So the experiment had 1400 partisans, so it included partisan independents who leaned towards a party, but it didn't include pure independents. Um, and the sequence of the survey, of, of the survey experiment was first people answered a variety of demographics and other types of variables about their backgrounds. It then asked people their anti-democratic meta perceptions, so how much they think the other side is going to engage in a variety of anti-democratic behaviors. It then asked anti-democratic attitudes. It then did the same thing for partisan violence. There were a, a bunch of attention checks embedded within the, the, the study. So there were four conditions. Um, so there was a control condition, which basically, not entirely, and I'll show you what I mean by not entirely in a moment, but basically just went through the sequence as I just showed you. There was a treatment correction, um, which I'll show you what that looked like in a little bit, but that basically is a going to correct people's misperceptions of the other side's meta of beliefs or correct met the meta perceptions. And then there were two other conditions. I'm going to introduce the other conditions a little bit later. And that's why this, it's a little bit of an unusual presentation, but hopefully you'll see why. Then I'm going to present half the experiment, then a little bit of theory, and then um, a little bit of, of, of further results. One of the reasons is because the first two conditions what I'm going to show you first are really just replicating all these other experiments that have been done already. So first, how do exactly do I measure anti-democratic attitudes? And this is far from straightforward. What I did here is because I'm, I'm interested in assessing the robustness of prior work is that I built on that prior work by using measures that others have used. Um, so I used a, a measure from a paper by um, uh, the first author, Braley, and, and a bunch of other colleagues. Um, and so some of the example items, I won't go through them all. But so, for example, if, if you're a, a, a Republican, it would ask you, would you support banning far left group rallies in the state capitol? We do support ignoring court rulings by Democratic judges and so on and so forth. And one nice, uh, of course, these measures are always a little bit um, fraught. 
Um, it's hard to capture it all, but this does capture kind of electoral norms, constitutional norms, um, as well as civil rights norms. So that's a positive attribute of the measure. Um, in terms of violence, this is also me this is measured between kind of being never or not justified to always or extremely justified. And an example of the questions is when, if ever, is it okay for a Democrat to send threatening and intimidating messages to Republican Party leaders, and so on and so forth. And this was a measure taken by um, Kelmo and Mason, um, which is a, a recent book that came out um, called um, Radical Partisans. And so those are the two measures I'm, I'm using. And so just to clarify before I show you what the control group looked like, so these are the outcome measures. So the meta perception measures, right, would be what I think the other side would say in answer to these questions, if that makes sense. So if I'm a Republican, would say, how do you think an average Democrat would answer the question, when, if ever, is it okay for Republicans to send threatening and intimidating messages to Democratic Party leaders? So in the control conditions, people first answered their meta perceptions, right? Remember, so they didn't answer these exact, these are the outcome measures. They answered the meta perception versions of these. And so then what they got after they answered the meta perception versions of these is they just got a table that just told them what they just said. And so, right, they got this table and you see in the first, this is for the violence example. Um, when is that, when if ever, is it okay for say Democrats to send threatening and intimidating messages to Republican party leaders? And then it says what your guess is. That is your guess of the meta perception, okay? Or your guess of what the other side would say, I should say, it's your meta perception. So you're just getting what your average meta perception score is. That's the control group. So the treatment group, remember, is going to be a correction. So it's basically taking the control group by telling you that your guess might be wrong and here's the actual answer. And so what that was, was basically the same type of table, but prior to the table, they're told that we also ask these questions of a nationally representative sample of the actual other side. So of actual Democrats, which I had actually done about a month before the, doing this. Um, from the same um, sample, um, I mean, the same population survey provider, and I got the actual scores. And so unlike the control, right, where they're only getting their guess, they're also getting the actual Democrats guess, if you're a Republican. And what, what you'll see, and I'll show you, is that because people exaggerate these things, right, so for example, the first question, what do you think Democrats would say in answering the question of whether it's okay for their party to send threatening messages, right, the average answer to that was like a 40 or a 50. And so what they're learning is that the actual a, actual average was more like a 14. And then at the bottom, you get your average of what your guess was and the average of what the actual percentage was. So in other words, we're correcting, we're, we're saying, here's what you thought the other side would think, but this is what the other side actually thought with the idea that that's gonna correct what you think, how bad the other side believes, and it's gonna lower your own violent scores or your own anti-democratic scores. Um, across those two outcomes. Okay, so first let's look at some of the results. So these are just the meta perceptions versus the realities, okay? So on the left side is the anti-democratic. So what's that showing on the zero to 100 point scale is that the average anti-democratic score emerging the parties here because there weren't big partisan differences was a 28. So they expressed a 28 in their anti-democratic attitudes, but they perceived the other side to be at a 58. So in other words, they were over-exaggerating by 30 percentage point how anti-democratic the other party was. When we turn to violence, the average score was 15. And again, they were perceiving the other side to be at about a 44. So in other words, again, they were almost by 30 percentage points exaggerating the extent to which the other side was violent. Okay, So we see this kind of massive exaggeration, which, which, which we anticipated. And so the question then is, what happens if this is just from the control group, right? So what happens in the correction group? Um, what do, does that tamp down their actual scores um, in terms of their anti-democratic attitudes and their support for partisan violence? And so here are the results, right? I just showed you that in the no correction condition, it's at about a 28. And what we see is when they got that correction, it did significantly decrease it to an 18. Okay. It also flattened the slope so that the relationship between what you thought of the other side and what your actual beliefs were is no longer significantly related to one another because you basically have updated your beliefs to what the actual beliefs of the other side are. Hopefully that makes some sense. But if not, the more important point is that the correction of what you thought the other side thinks caused you to lower your own anti-democratic attitudes. And we see the same thing for support for partisan violence, right? I already had showed you that it was 14.86 without a correction, but when you get the correction that the other side is actually not as violent as you may have thought, 
it's at about a nine. It's a, it's a significant decline. Okay, so that just you know pretty much confirms or it's consistent with all these other studies that have been out there that shows these corrections matter. But I'm gonna actually, I'll, sorry, I skipped around because I don't want to bother showing you the slope stuff. But I, this kind of led me to, to coming back to kind of scientific communication because I, you know that's another thing that I, I do a little bit of work in and, and I follow some of the, the work of, of your instructors very much. And I, I kind of realized that what these corrections are is there are pieces of scientific misinformation um, or I'm sorry, there are pieces of scientific information. And again, coming back to the kind of the science misinformation literature, we know that there's a lot of ways to try to undermine science information, right? And, and you know, in particular, we can look at the climate change disinformation or climate change skeptic organizations. And one of the main things that they've done over the last three decades or so is they've tried to explo exploit the uncertainty that's inherent in science, right? So the question that I, I asked myself was, well, what happens if when providing the scientific information, which is basically a survey result, if we remind people that any survey result, like any other piece of scientific information, actually has some uncertainty around it. So what do we know about that, right? So I just said the correction is a scientific information. Um, and so, right, what if we politicize it, and by politicize, I, I don't mean for a partisan agenda necessarily, but rather just emphasizing the inherent uncertainty of science by casting doubt about it, what happens? And what we know is that that generates some uncertainty, right, because you're saying it's uncertainty. And that often leads to some risk aversion and the dismissal of evidence. Um, and what we also know is that because we're talking about a competitive information landscape between different political sides, elites are going to have the incentive to exploit that uncertainty, right? So if, if, uh, if I go in and tell a bunch of Republicans that Democrats actually aren't that violent, another Republican might kind of come in and say, well, actually, Republicans are pretty violent. And so there's all of this, or I'm sorry, that would be the next thing I talk about. They might come in and they say, well, the information that you're getting about them not being that violent has a lot of uncertainty attached to it. And if we do that, that might undermine the effectiveness of the, the correction. Okay, I kind of already just forecast exactly the other kind of concern, which is competing information. So in all the correction studies that I've seen in this domain, they preclude counterframing or information of, um, about the opposing party. And of course, what we know is that each side always has an incentive to cast the other side in a negative light. And so again, as the example that I, I kind of had said prematurely, if the Democrats, if a Republic, if the Democrats come in and say, oh, the Repub if the Republicans come in and say, we're actually not that violent, Democrats would have an incentive to come and say, no, actually Republicans are pretty violent, right? So there's going to be this kind of back and forth competition about how to cast the other side. And what we know about that is when there's competing information of this type, um, at best it's gonna cancel out and people are gonna revert back to their prior beliefs. Um, and so, the question then for me was what happens, and this is what I did in the experiment, if we take the two the treatment correction condition, but we just add a little bit more information to them. One being pointing out the uncertainty that's inherent in polls, and the other providing a, a competing poll. And so by design, what I did is people got the treatment correction, and then after the treatment correction, they just were given something like this. Um, Recall that the average actual Republican score, so the, the actual scores that you just received, come from a survey we conducted with a nationally representative sample of, say, Republicans. That said, interpreting any survey or poll can be tricky and possibly unreliable, as was made clear by the 2020 presidential election polls. Indeed, a report from the American Association for Public Opinion Research states the average performance of polls in 2020 was amongst the worst in recent memory. And they could, if they wanted, actually link to that report. So that would be introducing the uncertainty around the poll. So in the in the other condition with the competing poll, an example of that with the um, anti-democratic um, scenario would be some may point to other surveys that point to, that offer a different picture. For example, an experimental survey by Yale political scientists looked at whether Democrats would vote for a Democratic candidate who took anti-democratic positions. The survey showed that 90% of Democratic voters continued to support the candidate even after the candidate violated democratic principles. The authors conclude that only a fraction shows democracy over partisan loyalty. And again, if they wanted, they could link to the article which had been published um, in the American Political Science Review. And so again, the idea here is that you're, it, with the correction, you're telling people there's some uncertainty to it, or you're telling people that there, or you're offering people a competing survey that showed something quite different. And then similar things for the violence scenarios, which I can talk about if we have time, the specifics of that, if we have time um, in the Q&A. So 
what happens? Um, what happens is what I anticipated could happen, right? Is basically the correction effect is no longer particularly robust. Right, so we see the first two bars is what you've are what you had already seen, right? You see the correction decreased anti-democratic attitudes, but as soon as you introduce that uncertainty or the correction competition, you see that the the significant decline no longer exists. It doesn't quite go all the way up, but statistically, it is equivalent to the no correction condition. And so you see that this kind of brief introduction of uncertainty or competition undermines the usefulness of that correction. And then in the violent situation, we see the same type of outcome, right? The first two bars of what you've already seen. But as soon as we introduce some uncertainty or the competition, it goes back up to the no correction scenario. OK, so what are the implications? So exaggerated meta perception shapes support for violence and anti-democratic attitudes. Um, and isolated corrections do seem to be able to counteract those effects. But it does seem that corrections are not robust to the introduction of uncertainty or competition. Um, and we all know that partisan elites have an incentive to paint the other side in unflattering terms, and hence uncertainty and competition are likely in, are, are likely commonplace, right? And we can think of a, a, a lot of examples even from this this week. For, it's only Wednesday, but we can already think of a lot of examples from this week. Um, you know, but if we go back a little bit in time, Biden's speech that he gave um, a little bit less than a year ago that Republicans are anti-democratic, um, the coverage of January 6 hearings and, and all the the, the cases. Um, Trump's claims of election fraud, coverage of Democrats' Antifa riots, and so on and so forth. Um, as a little bit of an aside, it does actually create an, a, a kind of challenging conundrum insofar as the defining element of democracy, and that is competition, is kind of undermining what people thought was this really nice intervention to help protect democracy. And so that is competition is not really um, particularly um, being very helpful to these types of corrections. So you could ask the question, are there other corrections? I'm not going to get into just because I want to allow some time for question and answers, but I'll briefly um, just talk about what we found in this. This was part of a, a very large project that I had done in collaboration um, with Rob Wither and Dave Rand, a sociologist and psychologist. And what we did is we, we crowdsourced, we asked for submissions, and then we tested 25 different interventions to reduce anti-democratic attitudes and partisan violence and some other things. And so we were looking at a whole host of different interventions. And it turned out that the most kind of very similar to in a, in a way that looked very similar to the part of my experiment with the basic two conditions, right? And it turns out that the most successful ones, um, there were two types that were particularly successful. One was the type of meta perception correction that I just showed you that I'm no longer that kind of um, kind of positive about or kind of hopeful about. And the other was having elites from both parties or an elite from your own party kind of give you a cue that you should be more pro-democratic or um, opposed to political violence. And so the, the, you already kind of heard now for quite a bit that I'm a little bit suspect about the meta-perception findings that were found in this big project. In terms of the elite finding, I think that raises a bunch of questions um, that I'm gonna end with. So I'll skip over those results. Um, and I, I think the questions are, um, I'll just skip to there. Um, it kind of, you'll see where I, I come back to how that raises these questions, but let me, step back for a second to where I, I kind of started in, in kind of putting the talk in this broader context. So there is, I, I talked at the beginning about this um, pluralism and checks and balances as being the checks on American democracy. And there has been this long running debate on whether you really need both. Um, so right, there's a, E.E. E. Schatzschneider was a very prominent um, 20th century political scientist and he captured this sentiment fairly well. He said, if the multiplicity of interest in a large republic, that is pluralism, makes tyrannical majorities impossible, the principal theoretical prop of separation of powers has been demolished. Or put another way, if pluralism makes things so cross-cutting, why do we need checks and balances? Because checks and balances end up just creating gridlock. So why do we need all of these different checks at, in both the societal and the institutional level? I think we can see now that there's an upside and a downside to having all of these things. Right. The upside is that having this kind of backup of institutional checks mean that legal checks can't constrain some extreme actions. Right. So we saw in the aftermath of the 2020 elections, you know, courts played a pretty substantial role in, in keeping um, Trump's efforts to overturn the election in check. Right. Over 60 courts ruled against his attempts to do that. So in that sense, having these secondary institutional checks were quite useful. But we also can see um, some obvious downsides. Right. The very fact that it's hard to institutionalize things because there are checks and balances, which makes doing anything novel kind of difficult, 
means that it's hard to formalize nor norms and ideals, right? So we've been operating for a long time in this country based on a lot of norms that are not written into any laws. Um, so for example, partisan gerrymandering, um, kind of different rules about um, um, voter suppression that we've kind of seen come up a lot. Um, those are, a lot of those are, have been done legally, right? They're within the law and they're very difficult to formalize because of these checks and balances. So you kind of see this trade-off um, in terms of having so much infrastructure in terms of institutions. Um, so this raises, and this is my last slide, kind of a bunch of questions. Um, so one is, does democracy depends on parties, parties and partisans' moral commitment to democracy? That is, I mentioned before, and this is why I mentioned this before, that other than the meta-perception correction in that big study that I was a part of, the other thing that seemed to work was when you got elites telling you um, to support democracy or be not violent. And the question is, do we have enough elites or, or you know, I don't know what that critical number would be um, if you only need a few not, but do we have enough elites with the moral commitment to democracy um, where they're going to endorse such things, even if it might not be in their competitive interests? And, and I'm not sure what the answer to that is. Um, and that raises this question of when we think about how democracy operates, um, is it entirely dependent on a self-enforcing equilibrium of the type that I talked about when I talked about the theories of anticipating the other side? Um, or, or does it depend on kind of some kind of a social or civic culture um, where people have a moral commitment to the democracy? Um, and kind of how, how do those two different conceptions of democratic uh, institutions and, and societies interact with one another? Um, and then if shared values are lacking, the question becomes how far can legal balance be enforced and do checks and balances work? Um, so, right, we saw in the aftermath of 2020 that the courts seem to play some role but you know, we don't know how far that can be pushed. Um, and you know, a lot of people are obviously worried about um, how far they might be pushed into the future. And that leads to the question, of course, of how endogenous are vital political institutions. And so um, there's a whole bunch of questions this leads to as well. Um, how should we conceptualize and measure norms, including support for violence? Um, so I, I kind of intimated bright briefly um, that the questions that I was using have been used on prior studies, but even kind of how do we think about how to measure these things has not been um, kind of fully kind of thought through, I think, in the literature and the work that's been done tonight to date. How do we connect citizens' beliefs to macro outcomes at the state or national levels? Um, that is, there, there's been kind of this real focus on citizens' opinions, um, perhaps because it's much easier to get data on citizens. But ultimately, we're really interested in whether the, the entire systems are eroding or backsliding. And most of that's going to come from elite action um, and, I, and you know, also societal or so, social movements are going to play an important role in that, right? We've just seen that in Israel in the last month, um, the role that social movements can play. Um, and so kind of how do we connect all of these different pieces together to think about systemic democratic erosion or backsliding? Um, should we think more about elites? Um, and then kind of this focus that has been on these corrections and the other things that were studied in the large study that I talked about, they're really looking at behavioral nudges. Um, and is that really a, a, a good research agenda to be pursuing? Or should we be thinking about more kind of systematic institutional incentives um, that might have longer lasting effects? Um, or, or, are the, or are these behavioral nudges something that can um, become behavioral norms um, that start to govern how people interact with one another? And I think that's an open question as well. Um, and so I will leave it at that. Um, and hopefully if anybody has any questions, I can um, try to answer them, but thanks for your attention.